Okay, everybody. So I saw that you didn't quite get what happened during the unification of Germany. So I'm going to do a quick overview of the steps that led to the unification of Germany. For this, we're talking about the period 1865 to 1871, but of course the story starts much before then. After the fall of Napoleon, what will become Germany was a mess of small German-speaking states called the German Confederation. And the Gener German Confederation was 39 different states kind of loosely grouped together. The two biggest are going to be Austria, or what will become Austria-Hungary, and Prussia. In Prussia, they really saw themselves as being the leaders of the, this German-speaking area because they had a mostly German population, unlike Austria, who had Italians, they had Hungarians, um, people from Czech, what will become the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So they really saw themselves as the forefront of the German-speaking population. Um, they were very proud of their country for a couple of reasons. We've talked about the fact that they had a very strong army and also the fact that they industrialized very quickly. So going back to our discussion of the Industrial Revolution, Prussia was able to industrialize, which made them a leader in this German Confederation. So Wilhelm I becomes the leader of Prussia. And Prussia had gone through revolutions in 1848, much like a lot of the other European states that we talked about. Um, and rioters in Berlin forced the king to basically write a constitution. And this constitution was fairly liberal. So it, it took away power from the traditional leading family, ruling family, and a lot of the nobility called the Junkers. All right, so 1861, Wilhelm I takes the throne of Prussia, and he wanted to make the military even better, but the parliament that he had to work with refused to give him money. Um, and the Junkers, again, this was the wealthy nobility, they supported Wilhelm. They didn't like these liberal reforms. So Wilhelm I appoints um, a Junker, although he had kind of come up by his own bootstraps, um, named Otto von Bismarck. And he appointed him as chancellor, or what we might think of as prime minister today. And he was a master of what, what is called real politic. And basically what that means is he would do whatever it took to get the job done. He wasn't necessarily worried about being diplomatic or negotiating. He was just going to do what he needed to do. So he decided he was just going to defy the Constitution and didn't really consult with Parliament. And he didn't get Parliament's approval for his budget meaning he just used the state's money without Parliament's approval. All right, so Otto von Bismarck, um, in his first speech to Parliament as a Prime Minister or as Chancellor, which should indicate what he's going to be about, he used this quotation, The great questions of the day will not be settled by speeches or by majority decisions. That was a mistake of 1848 and 1849 but by blood and iron. So he's saying that the riots, the nationalist riots in 1848, led to mistakes, and instead he's going to rule by blood and iron. What do you think he means by blood and iron? So most historians really believe that he was putting it out there that he's going to um, use war to achieve his ends, right? Blood of soldiers and iron the machinery of weapons. So he promptly goes on this um, and he starts to mold an empire. First, he forms an alliance with Austria. And again, he's a master of real politic. So he's gonna work with Austria at first and then against Austria later. So they decided to go to war with Denmark for two provinces that were northern Germany, um, south of Denmark. After they won, 
Austria got one of the provinces called Holstein, and Prussia ruled Schleswig. Right? And this arrangement didn't last very long because Bismarck stirred up conflict between the two provinces, which meant that the Prussians would have to step in and try to take control. So this provoked Austria into declaring a war on Prussia called the Seven Weeks War because it lasted seven weeks. Prussia was able to win easily, and this really shows um, von Bismarck's ideas of he's going to do what it takes. So he was an ally with Austria, and then when it suited his needs, he turned his back on them, and they went to war. So with this, by getting control of both Holstein and Schleswig, Prussia really annexed most of northern Germany. Um, Prussia had territory in the east over by Russia, and it had a little territory on the western side as well. So those two parts of the kingdom joined. Um, and this leads to the North German Confederation in 1867, again controlled by Prussia. In southern Germany, things were a little bit different. Um, in 1866, by 1867, a few Catholic German states were still independent, and Prussia was a Protestant country, although had had a history of religious tolerance. Um, the few Catholic states still weren't fully trusting of Prussia. So Bismarck decided that he could get these southern states to join him if they were threatened by an outside force. So what did he do? He basically, again, provoked a war with France called the Franco-Prussian War. So he published an altered telegram, um, and we've talked about telegrams before, the messages that were instantaneous communication of the time period. So, and this was all over a conflict over the Spanish throne. So that's a whole different story, but this conflict over the Spanish throne leads to tensions between France and Prussia. So Bismarck takes a telegram from Wilhelm. He alters it so that it seems like it insults France. This provoked France into declaring war on Prussia in 1870. Um, the Prussian army, again, very easily overwhelmed the French. The French leader was Napoleon III, and his military advisors really told him that he was, um, that, or rather that France had a chance of winning against Prussia, even though um, the Prussian army had better weapons and better strategy. Um, they were even able to keep, capture Napoleon III and hold him as prisoner. They laid a siege, the Prussians laid a siege around Paris, and this lasted for four months. Um, the Parisian people were starving, and rumors were flying that they even ate the animals in the Paris Zoo um, and stooped so low as to eat rats and pigeons, um, anything that they could get their hands on because the Prussians had them sealed off from the rest of France. So after four months, Paris surrendered, and that led to the Prussian victory, which again, the people in southern Germany, then the ones who had been holding out, not wanting to join Prussia, they felt a lot of nationalistic pride and decided that they did want to join Prussia after their victory in the Franco-Prussian War. So in 1871, January of 1871, King Wilhelm I was crowned Kaiser at Versailles. And we'll be talking, we'll be using the word Kaiser a lot when we get to World War I. Right? And Versailles, you probably remember, is the palace, the royal palace of the French people, right? King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette live there. Um, so this is where Wilhelm chooses to be crowned. Kaiser of the newly unified Germany. So you can see they're kind of um, rubbing it in to the French for sure that the Germans have won. All right, this is going to be the start of what, what they call, the Germans call the Second Reich. We're probably more familiar with the Third Reich, which was Hitler's 
um, plan for German dominance in Europe. The first strike was the Holy Roman Empire, and then again the Third Reich will be Hitler's reign. Uh, by 1871, Britain and Germany were the strongest in Europe in terms of nation states. France straggled behind, and Austria, Russia, and Italy were all very far behind. So we're really going to see tensions develop between Germany and Britain as the two kind of struggle for dominance in Europe. So this is setting the stage for what we talked about with imperialism and certainly the conflict that becomes World War I and then eventually becomes World War II. All right, so this is what brings Prussia together, or Prussia leading the unification of Germany. I hope that cleared things up.